when we do these, there's a, uh, there's a flow that uh, Sean puts together a curriculum that he gives out to Brother Jordan and Eric mm -hmm. so that as they're teaching, one time at one of our conferences I heard Brother Jordan mention that this is not a glorified Bible study. And you think about it, and it wasn't belittling Bible studies at all. But what we're, what we, our goal this week is to have a doctrinal flow of the end time, the eschatology. And there would be a, a doctrinal flow. And Sean uh, did a real good job at this introduction. If you see it, it says, an introduction to the things of the end. And the key is dispensationally delivered. And that's what these men will be doing this weekend. So if you get to come and stay with it, that's what you're going to get a flow that they uh, put in their, uh, their particular scriptures. And uh, it, that's absolutely something that has to happen for a person who has been saved and has the Spirit of God dwelling in them. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. Then the work begins, as 1 uh, Timothy 2, 4, 4, God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, mm -hmm. where there's a great, big, huge battle going on for the body of Christ, a saved person, not to come into the knowledge of the truth. And uh, our goal is to be presenting some of that this weekend. This book, when you hold this book in your hand, is something that's happened to me in the last six years. It was never as real as it is now, because of dispensational study, I can understand and trust God that he, he, he inspired his word, he preserved it, and I hold in my hand the word of God and have full confidence in that. This book teaches that doctrine all the way through. It's a tremendous teaching, and that's available too. Back there, uh, if, if it's not back there, you can get Brother Richard uh, Aldrich. He has some great teachings on the doctrine of preservation and inspiration on his table back there in the back. Over here on the right, back here to my right, is uh, Eric, I mean, uh, Sean. Sean's uh, table that he has all his information on that he works all that puts together. And also you can see the uh, camera here as he uh, records every one of these conferences and puts it back out on the internet. So these would be able, if you're interested, you can purchase these. And also they'll go on to the uh, website and go around the world. And he gets calls and comments from the, around the world on those. Over here to my left, you have Eric Newman at his table and has a great deal of information over there. Go take a look at that, all three of these tables. All of y'all, if you've done any Bible study in your life, I know y'all have. I know many of y'all's journeys. You're going to sit under a Bible teacher somewhere that's ahead of you, that has had the information this book revealed to them, placed into the inner man a sound doctrine, and be able to sit with people and take this book and rightly divide it from Genesis to Revelation and teach a person how they can come into the edification of the fullness of life. And I said this last year, that you can come to a place where you get up in the morning, Put your feet on the floor and know exactly who you are. That's that's big. Very few people can do that. And, uh, and there's also some doctrine in here. If that gets to be a little confusing sometimes, there's some uh, scriptures in here that can put you back, put on the new man, take off the old man. And that's that's phenomenal to see that. So we'll be doing some of that this week. Um, Sean, I mentioned your information, Eric, Brother George, uh, information back there on the back table. And uh, silent cell phones. We, we always forget that. Yeah, my, I got my note thinking. Oh. My note's coming up. And, okay. uh, the way I say it, just put your cell phone on for light. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so you don't go ringing and making a bunch of noise while they're up here teaching. I made a little note here again, and. You guys that's been around meetings, put together meetings, uh, uh, Frank Blakeman, who came down to this meeting tonight, couldn't make it. He's at the hotel room sick, I heard, and uh, we hate to see that. Uh, but he used to put big meetings.
meetings together over at Homer and things. And we put these few together over the years, and it's a good bit of work. Uh, JR, who does a tremendous amount of this work here, is just very, very helpful. Uh, I call it my, uh, what is it, MacGyver? Yeah, he just does everything. And, and uh, Rick, Lisa's husband, and, and Stan with the sound did a great job getting the sound hooked up. It fights you all the way, and that's just part of it. But let me tell you this quick story. We came in, we met here Wednesday, and we had heard some problems they were having here, but it could be a big mess. And the lady who goes to the fellowship next door had come in Tuesday and Wednesday, Connie and Gail met her and spent a good bit of time talking about right division with the lady who goes to the fellowship next door. And uh, after they all left and we finished up, everybody left and I was still here, it was like, y'all heard these guys that work, that operate and function on SEAL teams? You know, the SEAL team plans and plots and they get their mission together and they go in and SEAL team does their mission and they disappear. It was, except this was the oldest SEAL team group here. But they came in, it was really neat to see. Everybody came in and each one of them knew what to do, how to do it, set the tables up, the chairs, kind of mopped the place and just fixed it up. And then within four or five hours, I think everybody was gone, then we continued doing a little, tweaking a little stuff here and there. So it was really neat to see everybody fall in, do what we have to do to be able where we at tonight. We appreciate that from all, all the workers that did that. All the good help. And um, got all that covered. After having said all that, take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 3. And we'll do a, let's do a scripture reading. In our busy minds that we've been running all day, some of y'all hung up in traffic in the uh, the pressures of this old world gets on us and gets our mind busy and going all different directions. So let's put our eyes on some scriptures and we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 3. And we'll read uh, 14 through 21. You ready? For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to to the riches of his glory. Make a note, if you would, one day of that word according. That word is all through your Bible. I think it's 716 times just in the New Testament. You'll see it twice in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's a very important word. According to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the depth, what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And Father, we do thank you that we can come and have you live in us, your son Jesus Christ, our life, and that we are a brand new race of people. And there's a growing in that. We have to grow into that and be built up in that understanding and to, and to go into the knowledge of the truth and understand the edification process. We thank you for this opportunity to present this this weekend and for everybody that come, for the teachers and all the work they put in to be with us tonight, and for Donnie and uh, Mike as they come on up to sing after this prayer. And that's just really great to have them here to uh, share that with us. It's something that's been missing here, and they stepped up and took that on, and it's very important. We thank them for that, and we thank you in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's great to be here. Uh, the reason you don't have any song books, it's my fault. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's the way the day's been going. Uh, it'll get better, but uh, uh, everybody sing up if you know the song. I hope you know the song, because if you don't, like I said, you'll still enjoy it. One, two, three. I know not why, not why, 
somewhere you had a family that did it if you're under 30 years old you've lived long enough where there's no bible it's it's wrong to mention the bible in school it's wrong to talk about scripture in public places uh, i met a young man several years ago maybe five six years ago down in chicago he's a graduate of a of a very prestigious law law school in chicago um, international reputation works at a he's a lawyer works at a uh, one of the top five law, law firms in, in the city of Chicago. He's 30, 31 years old. And we were talking about the Good Samaritan Law. And you, you know what that is. 
And, and I asked her, I said, do you have any idea where that name came from? Now here's a young man practicing law at the top of the, of the profession, graduated from the top schools, probably one of the top five schools in the, in, in the country. And he said, well, no, I don't really know where that name came from. And I said, well, it came from a, a parable that Jesus taught in the Bible. He says, that can't be. And I said, well, what do you mean it can't be? He said, it can't be. Separation of church and state, they can't name a law after something in the Bible. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're, you, you live in a culture now. And those of you that are my age, which means you're older, you remember a different world. But if you're young, you think about somebody 30 years old, what they remember and what they know. Think about the, just, you know, you go back, I, the 7th of December. How many of you know what the 7th of December is? You know, I ask that question in meetings and find, find half the crowd won't know what the 7th of December is. Pearl Harbor Day. What's that? Now you can ask them about the, you know, the in my generation, it was my dad's generation, my generation, it was the uh, assassination of uh, John Kennedy and Martin Luther King in the early, in the early 60s. We remember that. Uh, for the current generation, the millennials and so forth, it'll be 9-11. Those, those remarkable days of, 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 of impact that you remember. But you know, when you think about that, those of us that remember those things, and, and you, you have to understand those are, there are generations that are coming that haven't had uh, given to them, put into their frame of reference, the heritage of our country. There are people that can tell you what the LGBT, XYZ, meaning, many mighty, mole new things are, and can't tell you who Thomas Jefferson was, or what he wrote, or what he did. And that's a straight, that, that, that's, that, that, that's the way it is. So when you're studying the Bible, you have to understand a lot of people, many people that you meet, don't, they, they're not even at, at square one. We've got a guy in our assembly that has only been saved just a few months. And again, he's a college graduate, got, a, got a graduate degrees, is a smart guy, very, very uh, proficient in his profession. And he's reading in, our, in a book and, and if I write Romans 1, colon 16, what does that mean? The book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 16. You all know that. He had no idea what that meant. He said, I, I take that, you know, book so-and-so, section so-and-so, and, -so, and he, he's, a, he's an attorney, and he's thinking of the way things, citations are written in legal terms. And he said, oh, is that what that means? I wondered how you kept that straight. Now, we teach that to our first graders, okay, in our Sunday school. Here's a guy who's 40 years old and didn't know that. So for him, studying the Bible, he starts out at a real deficit. Now, what we're going to do this weekend is going to be, it's, if I say it's over his head, I would be true. But can I tell you, he's caught up. <laughs> how long did it take him to figure out how to write a verse? about 30 seconds, as soon as he saw somebody talk, told, told him. I remember when my, one of my boys, uh, brought a, he, before he got married, he brought this girl to church that he was dating, he ultimately married her. And he would sit there, and he, he was one of, you know, when, when you're a teenager, I gotta learn how I gotta do that. And he, would, he could sit in the church, and he, he could find the passages and turn to them and show where the verses were, and she'd go, wow smart he is. <laughs> so it, it did him some good to learn where the, where the books of the Bible were. But those are just basic study skills. Now, what we're going to do this weekend, Jerry mentioned, this is going to be some intensive Bible study. We're going to focus on something that is one particular phase of studying the Bible, and that is the prophetic program, the program of prophecy. And we're going to focus on a specific issue in the study of prophecy in the prophetic program, and that is what the Bible calls the last days, and the conclusion, the goal of prophecy, and what it's about. But if you're going to grasp any kind of a subject like that, you need to get the big picture to start with. In Colossians chapter 1, I'll just read it because I didn't tell you to turn there, but you can look at it. Colossians 1 verse 9, when Paul says, for this cause... 
we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding well that verse says paul says i'm praying that you would be filled with the knowledge of god's will God's will that he's thinking about there is not where should you, where does God want you to be tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock? Hmm. Can I tell you that God, for the most part, doesn't care where you are tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock. He cares how you are where you chose to be. Follow that? Now that's, I just threw a monkey wrench into 98% of Christian theology. But the, what he's talking about here is the big picture. If you want to know God's will for your life, quit talking about you and talk about Him. The issue isn't what are you doing, the issue is what is He doing. And if you want to know the will of God for your life, find out what God is doing, go do that, and you'll be doing the will of God by definition. You see, we get that backwards. We want to know, we're, we're calling us, I want, where should I be? What should I do? Where, where, where should, and we make it all about us. Well, that isn't the will of God. The will of God is what God's doing. And when you get the big picture, Paul said, I want you to be filled with all, with a knowledge, and not only be being filled, be gripped by, be, be, be controlled by an understanding of what it is God's doing, what the big picture, it'll give you, Wisdom, spiritual understanding. So that what we're going to do tonight, what my assignment is, is to introduce the whole enchilada. And to give you the ability to understand as we look tomorrow at a section of what God's doing, how it fits in the whole. Okay? All right, Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We pray that we, as we look into it, it might instruct our hearts. Thank you for these folks who are willing to come and spend to themselves to be in a meeting like this and to give of themselves to study. We pray these things might be clear and understandable and that your word might be the thing that instructs us. And we thank you in Christ's name. You see that verse 2 Timothy 2.15, study. The responsibility of a member of the body of Christ is to study God's Word. You need to understand. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon said, much study is weariness of the flesh. And I guess that's why people don't like to study. A fellow told me one time, he said, you know, Brother Rick, I've been coming to your church for about six months. I'm not going to be coming anymore. And I said, okay. And he said, well, don't you want to know why I'm not going to be coming? I said, well, you know, you, you just told me not coming. I guess you got a reason. He says, well, don't you want me to tell you? I said, well, if you want to tell me, like, okay, I'm not, I'm not all, you know, worried about it. He said, well, I just want you to know it's too much work to go to your church. And I said, work? What are you talking about? You had not done anything but sit on a pew. You had to kick, you, had, <laughs> you had to hit a lick of a snake. He says, well, well, I've been going to church where people write notes. They're talking to each other to where they're going to go out for the meeting. Everybody in your church taking notes, writing down verses. It's work to go to your church because everybody's writing down what's being said, and then they're going to study it. What a concept. <laughs> Listen, we're not... A local assembly is not designed for entertainment. Hmm. It's designed for your edification. It's designed for your being built up in the faith, and that's going to require some study. Did you know that if you read three chapters a day in Paul's epistles, that you would read his epistles through them in 29 days? There are 87 chapters in Paul's epistles. Think about that. If you divide 87 by 3, you get 29. Mm -hmm. You read three chapters a day in one month, you could read his epistles through from, from Romans 1 to, to Philemon. Just three chapters a day. If you're a dog slow reader that, 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 that didn't seem to have any time, you could read three chapters. Just turn that boot tube off. You know, quit listening to like garbage that you the, that, that you do wasting that and read three. If you did that for six months, that would change your life so much that there's no way for me to stand here and explain to you what you'd be like in six months after doing that. That's how powerful God's word is. You see what he says in verse 7? Consider what I say. 
and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. If you just took in what Paul's word, just just read it. Don't don't try to don't don't try to do a thing. Just just read it. And you read three chapters a day and a month, twenty nine days. You read you read through his epistles. There's not one person in this room that can't do that. There's not one person in this room that shouldn't do that. The next year when I see you, I'm going to ask you, <laughs> how many of you have read Paul's epistles through 12 times? Uh-huh. And everybody's going to raise their hand and say, Brother Rick, we just read it. I've got to do it, read three chapters a day. And I can read it through 12 times in, in a year. And it'll change your life. if you, Because that's what God's Word does. Study. This, by the way, is the only verse in the Bible that tells you to study the Bible. <clears throat> if you look back at, hold, hold on, look back at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Did you know the Bible never tells you to attend church? I love that. I believe in going to church. I, I'm a pastor. I pastor a church. The church I pastor, I pastored it almost 40 years. And I started churches in Alabama before we went, went to Chicago. Uh, I believe in going to church. I've raised three kids, and our family, we believe that if there was a reason for the doors to be open, there was a reason for us to be there. So I'm not against going to church. I'm for it. But you know there's not a verse that says attend church. And I'm a, I know what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says. I'm, I'm familiar with that passage. It's got nothing to do with, with going to church. It's got nothing to do with anything you're going to do in your life anyway. But there is a verse that tells you to attend something. Look at it, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 13. Till I come, give attendance to what? Reading. Reading. Exhortation and doctrine. You should attend to reading. You should show up. If you if Paul's telling you to read something, what do you think he's telling you to read? Bible. Well, Isaiah 34, God told Israel, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Get you a King James Bible and start reading it. I was waiting for an amen. Amen. I'll say, oh me, how about that? Study. That's what it starts. It starts with the intake of God's word on a daily basis. Study to show thyself approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2.15 What we're looking for is God's approval. Now, not all believers are going to have God's approval when it comes to to, 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 to their workmanship. Study to show that self approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. You see, God wants workmen, not shirkers, but workers. When we talk about grace, you don't grace doesn't save you on the basis of your works. That doesn't mean grace isn't interested in good works. When he puts you into Christ Jesus, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under the good works which God before and that we should walk in them. So how are you going to do that? You're going to study to show your, your goal is to have God's approval. So you can be a workman working on working together with God. How do you do it? Rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, you have a book that is the word of truth. But there are differences, there are distinctions in that Bible that have to be made and recognized. We call that dispensational Bible study. Now watch how he explains that to you in verse 16 and following. But shun profane and vain babbling. If you don't rightly divide the word, it's profanity. I was in Arizona last week and I don't see much nighttime television. We're, I'm busy in the evenings, and my wife and I generally don't get home until somewhere, not somewhere to nine, ten o'clock at night is almost every night. And so we don't see a lot of nighttime TV. But I was in a home where on, a, on Tuesday night there were some TV shows, and we were, it was a holiday. We were watching them, and I was stunned at the level of vulgarity and profanity on night on, on television, network TV, one show was where a grandmother is talking to her grandchildren and she's cursing at them with the vilest curse words. And I'm thinking, heavenly days, <laughs> turn that off. But I'm thinking, that's, uh, and somebody says, well, that's the way people talk. No, it isn't. If your vocabulary isn't any bigger than that, you shouldn't be on TV, but you shouldn't be talking very much anyway. <laughs> 
we call that profanity, cursing. You see how he uses that word? Shun, profane, and vain. That is worthless, empty, jabber, babblings. Vain janglings, he calls it in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Shun. If you don't rightly divide the word, your preaching and your teaching is just a bunch of profanity and is worthless. And it says they will increase under more ungodliness. If you want the answer to why our culture has gone the way it's gone, that verse is telling you. There's not, a, there's not been the teaching of God's word. There's been the profanity, the profane, empty, worthless use of the Bible. But the fact that the, the, the power of God's word has been taken out of it, and then ungodliness just increases. And their word will eat as doth a canker. This eats the heart out of, of things. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, now watch, who concerning the truth have erred. Now what did they do to err? Saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Now Jerry, that's why nobody ever gives me one of these things. I've already misplaced it. There it is. <laughs> Notice what he says. They've erred concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection... Now, if you remember the body of Christ, where we are right here, the body of Christ concludes with the rapture, we call it. The Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which arrive in Christ shall be caught up together with them. Mm -hmm. That's that verse in 1 Corinthians 15 that you put in the nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Mm -hmm. Whether, you're, whether you die or whether you're, you're alive when the Lord comes, you're going to get your new body. These guys are saying that that resurrection is past. Now think about it. If the resurrection that concluded the dispensation of grace is past, where would they be? Would they be here or over there? It's future if you're here, right? If you're in the tribulation, it's past. You see what they did? Dispensational Bible study is you draw a timeline. And on that timeline, you put the doctrines of the Bible. And when you do it correctly, you rightly divide it, you make the correct distinctions, then you have things put in the places where they go. And when you err, when you don't rightly divide the word of truth, but you err concerning the truth, then you put the resurrection in a place where it doesn't belong. They were literally saying the dispensation of grace is over and they were in the tribulation period. Mm -hmm. Now that's a dispensational mistake, but that illustrates what dispensationalism is. It's simply taking God's word and laying it out on a timeline. Now the question then is whose timeline do we want to use? Well, who told you to do it? God through Paul told you to do it. So who would be the most logical person to ask how to do it? God through Paul, right? Look back at Ephesians chapter 2 and watch him do it. Ephesians chapter 2. That chart up there is simply an attempt to diagram this passage. 2 Timothy 2 verse number 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, but that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So there is a, there's a time in the Bible called time past. And in time past, there's something going on. In time past, there's a group of people that are called the circumcision, and there's another group of people who are called the uncircumcision. Now who are they? Who are the circumcision? That's the nation Israel. God made a covenant with Abraham. And when he made that covenant, Acts chapter number 7, Stephen calls that covenant the covenant of circumcision. He gave Abraham a sign and a seal of that covenant, which was circumcision. So God took, took out of all the nations of the earth one man, Abraham, made him a nation in the earth. And back here, he made a covenant called the covenant of circumcision. And that covenant set, set apart these people from these people. You see how that verse says that? 
Wherefore, remember that you being, ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by... These people were calling each other names. And they were doing it in a contemptuous way. You remember David goes out to fight Goliath? And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He wasn't complimenting Goliath's mom when he did that. Jesus stands before Pilate and he says, am I a Jew? He wasn't complimenting the Lord Jesus Christ in his parentage when he did that. Verse, verse 12, it's more than just a social distinction though. There's a spiritual thing going on here. That at that time, ye Gentiles were without Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, he came in time past. When you have the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that record the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, when he came, he says he came to these people, and these people down here, they were on the outside. That at that time you were without Christ. Why? Being, because of who they were as Gentiles. Aliens from what? The commonwealth of Israel. You weren't a part of this nation. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. God made promises and he made covenants with these people back here. But these people down here didn't have any of those covenants and promises. And they were without Christ because they were, with, were, were aliens from the covenants of promise, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But, verse 13, now. So that status back there has changed, and but now things are different. Well, what happened? Jesus Christ died at, the, at Calvary. Look with me at Romans chapter 11. He died, he was resurrected, he ascended into heaven, sends the Holy Spirit back on those people here, and there came a point, it's the book of Acts, there came a point when something changed. Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter 11. Verse number 11. I say then, have they, that is Israel, who he's talking about, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 is all about the nation Israel. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Notice, sometimes people read that verse and they go, what's he talking about? Because he goes through kind of quickly. He says, have they, that is Israel, stumbled that they should fall? And he says, no. So they stumble. Well, when do they stumble and don't fall? You ever do that? And catch yourself and don't fall? Israel did that. Look at chapter 9, verse number 32. Romans 9, 32. Wherefore, because, well, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not you know, attained unto the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoso believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There came a point in time when Israel stumbled at that stumbling stone, and that's, that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 8, and that only time that ever happened in history was right there at the cross when Israel crucified. They said, Away with it, we'll not have this man right over us. We have no king but Caesar. But you notice they stumble at that stumbling stone and that rock of offense, but they do not fall. That's why on the cross, the first cry that Christ made from the cross was, Father, what? Forgive, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. John the Baptist was a man sent from God to call Israel to repentance. And when John the Baptist did that, Israel rejected God the Father through John the Baptist and allowed Herod to kill him. Then they have God the Son here and they they don't just allow Herod to kill him. They demand Pilate kill him. Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They get a reprieve from that. But, go back and read the verse. Romans 11, 11. But, 
rather through their fall then subsequent to that point right there they do fall so the fall of Israel does take place over here and it takes place in Acts chapter 7 with a guy named, named Stephen and through the fall of Israel salvation goes to the Gentiles now that's important because back here salvation is going to go to the Gentiles through the rise of Israel in a kingdom this, these people back here had a hope that hope and I didn't read the verse, but you go back to Ephesians 2, verse 7, and it talks about that in the ages to come. So there's a future, by the way. See how smart that is? And you ought to give me a, an alpha. Past, present, future. What's a timeline? Past, present, future. Future. What are we looking for? A timeline to put the Word of God on. Past, present, future. Who did that? Paul did it. God through Paul did that. Well, I didn't do it. I'm just taking Ephesians and trying to diagram it for you. That man in time past had a hope back there. It had to do with being saved from the wrath of God and Christ coming back as their Messiah and setting up a kingdom over here. That tribulation period, time of Jacob's trouble, that millennial kingdom that goes out into eternity, that was the hope, that was the promise that God made to Israel back there. This is what we're going to be studying about yes. this weekend, mm -hmm. this, this point here. That's the goal of the prophetic program. That's the goal of God having an intention to put his authority back in the earth through a kingdom vested in the nation Israel. That was what was being preached and offered to Israel back here. That's what they were rejecting. They get a renewed opportunity of repentance as the book of Acts starts. The fall of Israel takes place here, and now salvation goes to Gentiles, not through Israel's rise in the kingdom glory, but through Israel's fall. Hold your hand here in Romans 11. Look at Isaiah chapter 60, starting chapter 59, verse 20. Isaiah 59, verse 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion unto them and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. That passage is quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter number 11, verse 26 and 27. As for me, this is my covenant with them, with Israel, saith the Lord, my spirit which shall be upon them, upon thee, and my words which I have put in, in, in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, uh, saith the Lord, from hence forth for how long? Forever. The Redeemer comes out of Zion, comes back, and he's going to set his kingdom up in the earth, and, and Israel is going to be redeemed and established in the kingdom. The goal of prophecy is going to begin to be fulfilled. Now watch what happens in chapter 60. Arise. Here's the Messiah calling to his people. Shine, for thy light is come. You remember Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise and upon, upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Now watch. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So Israel is going to rise to be the head of the nations, and through Israel, through that covenant God made with Abraham, salvation is going to go out and fill the earth. We'll study all about that tomorrow, about the, about the goal of prophecy and what's going to happen. That's what, that was the hope that this man back here in time past had, and it looked toward the future out there. Where Gentile salvation, listen, the day of Gentile salvation is right out there. When Jesus Christ, before he left back over here in his post-resurrection ministry, he gave his apostles, look up at Matthew 10, he gave them some, some orders. People talk about the, the marching orders. If you want to see the real great commission, it's in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, the Lord Jesus Christ ordained the 12 apostles, commissioned them as apostles. 
when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. You see how they are disciples in verse 1? Now they are apostles. He has commissioned them. He's given them power, authority to act. Here's their commissioning. Verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, now watch, go not into the way of the Gentiles. How does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. And into any city of the Samaritans, enter you not. You ever had anybody say, I just going to do what Jesus said? I'm just going to go walk by what Jesus, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to follow Jesus. Anybody tells you that, they're lying through their teeth. First, they don't know what Jesus said. I mean, I said they're lying. They, 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 have no, they, wouldn't know that. they wouldn't know that was verses in the Bible if you gave them six months to look for it. But when he commissioned his apostles originally, he said, don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So you know who they ministered to back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? They ministered to the nation Israel, and that's the only people they ministered to. That's why in, in, in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, when that Syrophoenician woman came, up, came to, to, the, to, to the disciples and said, My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. I need, I need Jesus to heal them. Jesus didn't answer her. He didn't even answer her. He didn't even say hello to her. He just walked away. She went to his disciples and said, hey, help me. They go to Jesus and said, would you do something for us? She's driving us nuts. <laughs> and he looked at him and he said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mark says it this way, the children must first be filled. <laughs> you see, it wasn't that Jesus didn't love the Gentiles and wasn't willing to save them or help them. It was that the order... In the Abrahamic covenant was, I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing. And the salvation and blessing of God was going to go to these people through these people. If these people, if the channel of blessing is clogged up, what do you got to do? Mm -hmm. Unclog the channel. You go all through Matthew, the gospel of the, of the king. You see a, we're coming up to Christmas. You see in Matthew chapter 2. The picture of the, the wise men. Did you know they didn't come to the, the manger? They never saw Jesus in the manger. You see, man, you'll see manger scenes all over the place. And you have the shepherds, and, and you have the wise men, and you have the angels with wings and the star in the background. That's just a bunch of religious hokum. There was no star over the babe in Bethlehem. Nonsense. Don't you ever think about the Bible? Yes. I mean, you're, so, you're such a Bible blockhead that you don't know the star didn't show up over the manger. I don't mean you that way, but I'm talking about, well, maybe you are. But <laughs> the point is, that isn't what the Bible says. That's what religion does with it. The wise men didn't, the wise men didn't show up for maybe two years. Mm-hmm. And they went to Jerusalem. They didn't go to Bethlehem. Why did they go to Jerusalem? Because they're looking for him as born king of the Jews. Where's the city of the great king? Matthew 5, 35, Jesus said, Don't swear by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. They went to where the king ought to be. And when they, these Gentiles came looking for the king in Israel, in Israel's capital, it says that Herod and all Jerusalem were troubled at that say. Israel was the problem. And even though the Gentiles came seeking him, Israel wasn't ready to be the... So what, what you have the Lord doing back here is he's gathering that little flock of believers who's going to be the believing remnant in Israel. That ministry is only to Israel back here for a reason. Now that can help you. Romans 15 verse 8, he says, that, I said that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. That is, his ministry belongs in time past back here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his earthly ministry to confirm the, the, the promises of the Father, the truth of God and the promises of the Father. This thing back here, you know when Jesus 
gave instructions. He healed people. He told them, whatever you ask in prayer, believing it will be given to you. He did all these things. And you go back and try to pull those verses out and try to obey them. That don't work. And you say, well, there must be something wrong with me. I think one of the silliest things you ever heard. People say, well, you know, people struggle with it with unanswered prayer. The problem with unanswered prayer isn't unanswered prayer. The problem with unanswered prayer and the problem of prayer preaching and teaching is not being dispensational. Mm -hmm. Trying to claim instructions, obey instructions that were never given to you, have nothing to do with you, and how God works with you. And when you go to John 15 or Mark chapter 11 or Matthew chapter 21 or Matthew chapter 7 to get instructions about prayer, well, you're trying to, you're up the creek without a paddle, dude. It's got nothing to do with you. So instead of being burdened and confused and frustrated and thinking God doesn't love you and there must be sin in my life, listen, all these theological gimmicks that people develop to try to excuse the fact that the, that the verses don't work in the life, when the reason they don't work in their life is they don't have anything to do with you and you've never been big enough a day in your life to make God do something he isn't doing. You say, well, he once did it. I know. But it's not what he's doing now. He did it in time past. You say, well, that's not fair. Well, get over it. <laughs> Listen, it's not of him that willeth or runneth. It's God that gives instructions. It's God's will that's the issue. And if you want to live in rebellion against God, well, then see what that gets you. Through the fall of Israel, salvation goes to the Gentiles. That's the purpose of the ministry of the Apostle Paul in the Bible. Because when the fall of Israel took place, God revealed to the Apostle Paul that he's going to have a new agency in the earth, a new group of people called the church, the body of Christ, in which there's neither Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, but you're all one in Christ. There's this one spiritual body of belief, a new agency. Israel is his agency back here. The body of Christ is his agency here. Israel back here, the issue back here in Israel is establishing his authority over the earth. The body of Christ, the issue is establishing his authority over the heavenly places. That's different. Back here in Israel's program, the operating system is the law. The Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Law, the Messianic Law, but law nonetheless. Performance-based acceptance. In here, the operating system is grace. Grace is the gift system. It's I give it all to you up front. It's yours to start with. It's yours completely and totally. Now, just let it be what lives in you. This program back here, time past, is called prophecy. This program in here is called, I spell it right, called the mystery, the secret. This program is what God has been speaking by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. This program is one that he kept secret since the world began, but now with the ministry of Paul has made known. If you can get that distinction, between that which has been spoken by the mouth of all the Holy Ghost. That's what Peter says in Acts 3.21. People say, well, I thought the church, the body of Christ began at Pentecost. Well, you're the only person that thought that. Well, well you, you and your religion. God didn't think that. Peter didn't think that. Speaking as the Spirit gave him utterance. If God the Holy Spirit didn't think the body of Christ began at Pentecost, who do you think's right, you or him? I'm going to give you a clue. It ain't you. <laughs> and it ain't your church and it ain't your, your religious system it's not your preacher it's not your grandma it's not anybody that you, that you know anything about if God the Holy Ghost didn't think the body of Christ began at Pentecost then I'm going to guarantee you it didn't start there because he knew what he was doing you got people going to say well it was there it just wouldn't reveal you mean God the Holy Ghost didn't know what he was doing beautiful Hello. 
That's crazy. This stuff back here is, is the continuation of Israel's program. It's prophecy. Peter says, Acts 3, 21, what I'm telling you is that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. So when we study prophecy, we're going to be studying all this stuff back here that God had planned, written, and, and promised about that looks to the ages to come to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. This ministry in here is the preaching of Jesus Christ, Romans 16 says, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. And, you know, I, for decades I've been telling people this, and I have a lady at the right, ask her, don't you know any other verses? I said, yeah, I do, but if you get, the, get these first, <laughs> something that's been spoken about, talked about, and made known since the world began is not the same as something that was kept secret, not talked about, not spoken about since the world began. How do I know? I can read. <laughs> That's all there is to it. You don't have to, listen, you don't have to have a college education. You don't have to know Hebrew and Greek. You don't need a preacher that's got all that. All you need to do is get a King James Bible and look at Acts chapter 3, verse 21, and Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, and put them next to your, themselves in your Bible and see that they're different. And if you'll let the words on the page in a Bible make the difference for you, it'll make a difference. Now, if they don't make a difference for you, then enjoy your life and forget being having any kind of life from the Word of God. You're free to believe anything you want to believe. God, if God is willing for you to not believe Him, I'm willing for you not to. But don't go around and say you're a Bible believer when you can't see those two verses are different. It doesn't take, it's not rocket science, it's just plain, simple, fifth grade English. Prophecy back here, Israel's program. Here we are in the dispensation of grace. One day this program is going to be over. Why do you form the body of Christ? To have an agency to establish its authority in the government of the heavens. Israel is going to establish its authority in the government in the earth. Come with me to Exodus chapter number 19. Now we're not studying about the body of Christ. We're not studying about us. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. focusing about what we're doing. But I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about what Israel is, is, program is. Exodus chapter 19. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, and go back with me, get Exodus 19 to one hand in Genesis chapter 12. Exodus 19 and Genesis 12. And you just have to break into this thing somewhere, so I'm going to, I'm going to start with Abraham. Genesis 12, verse number 1. The Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Where is he going? He's going to a land, a literal, physical, visible location on the earth. And I will make thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. There's a reciprocity of conduct. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So all the families of the earth can be blessed where? In Abraham. Mm -hmm. Come on, Abraham. Chapter 13. That was what he told Abraham when he was in Ur, telling him to come out. Exodus 13. I'm sorry, Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the what? Land. Literal, physical, visible land. Which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for how long? Forever. forever. How long is forever? Forever. It's forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. 
Your eyes walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to give you a seed, a multiplied nation to live in that land. I'm going to bless you, and through that nation, I'm going to bless everybody else. Chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come thither, hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is, is yet full. And it shall come to pass that when the sun went down and was dark, behold, a smoke, smoking furnace rather, and a burning lamp that passed between these pieces, those pieces. And in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, under, the, under thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile, under the great river, the river Euphrates. Now that's a whole lot more land than they've got now. We're not just talking about the West Bank. We're talking about the whole totality of that Middle East territory. The Kenites and the, and the um, Kenizzites and the... And the Place. The Kadamites Kedo, Kedo, and the Hittites and the Parasites and the Rarefem and the Parasites and all the otherites. <laughs> all that territory that those Gentile nations are in, he said, that's yours. He gave Abraham a literal physical land. Look at chapter 17. Verse number 6. This is when he changed his name, verse 5, from Abraham to Abraham. Verse 6, I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and, 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 and uh, thee, and thy seed after thee in the generations for an everlasting covenant. And it shall be a, uh, and to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, and I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land. Where thou art a, or, or a stranger, all the land of Canaan. For a what's that next word? How long are they going to have it? Forever. <laughs> Abraham knows he's going to die. He knows a lot of his seed's going to die, and he's going to get that land forever. In, how can that be? Why don't you have that come with me to Job chapter 19? Job knew this. Job was a good Israeli. Look at Job's first book in the Bible ever written. It's the oldest book in the Bible. Here's the hope of the man. Here's, here's Job's hope. Job chapter 19, verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter days where? Upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. How's that going to happen? Resurrection. Resurrection. Inherit. Listen, if Abraham's going to get, get going to have a seed that's going to possess that land forever, somebody's going to have to get everlasting life, eternal life, resurrection life. When Abraham took Isaac up on that mountain in Genesis 22, he told those lads, he said, the lad and I are going to go yonder and worship and, and come back. What's he going up on that mountain to do? Kill him. God said, go up there and offer your son. You know what Abraham did? People said, why? Why would God tell Abraham to go up and kill his boy? Why would Abraham do some dastardly thing like that? Because Abraham knew that that wasn't the end. He knew about resurrection. Mm-hmm. And he knew that that was the seed, and even if he went up there and killed that seed, God would resurrect him. Why? Because he had that promise that that's the seed, and he's going to be the seed forever. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on back there. They understand that. And so inherent in this promise back here is to get that land and a nation in the land and kings, a kingdom in that land, and that it's going to last forever. Mm-hmm. 
And it won't just be the West Bank. And it won't be any, it won't make any difference if the United States moves their embassy to Jerusalem and everybody pitches woo. What's going on over, on over there today doesn't have anything to do with this stuff. Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up his throne in the city of Jerusalem because it's the capital of the, of, it's the city of the great king. Yes. He'll come back and take that territory back and said it is the seat of his kingdom. And by the way, that will be the command center for the whole universe. Look at Genesis chapter 28. As God begins to educate this Abraham and this Isaac and then there's Jacob and as each time that covenant is, it, listen, if it's Abraham, it wasn't everybody else. Only Abraham's seed. It's Isaac, it's not Ishmael. That's God choosing. When he says Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he said it's Isaac, it's not Ishmael. Ishmael was the, 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 the fruit of Abraham's flesh. He was Abraham and Sarah's idea. He was rebellion against God. What your flesh can produce, God won't have. He gave him Isaac. It's Esau, it's Jacob, not Esau. Esau despised his birthright. Jacob valued it. It's going to be Jacob, not Esau. There's a choice. That ancient hatred that Ezekiel talks about, that Obadiah talks about, that will be, it goes all through there, the ancient hatred of Israel. You know why all those people, it goes back to Ishmael. Esau bought into it. He, he goes and marries some of Ishmael's mama's relatives. That ancient hatred of Israel was really nothing but jealousy of the Abrahamic covenant, the promises God made. Mm -hmm. Because God made them and not Ishmael. Them and not Esau. And that hatred against the plan and purpose of God festers all through history and makes them a despised people. Well, as God begins, when Isaac, he begins to educate Isaac. And then he educates Jacob in what's going to happen. Genesis 28, you, you teach the kids about we are climbing Jacob's ladder. You know that song? Here's the, here's the place. Jacob is running from Esau. And he stops at a place called Bethel, a place he names Bethel. And uh, verse 12 says, He dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending. Notice what they're doing. The ladder's down here on the earth. And it, it, it reaches up into heaven. And the angels are on the earth ascending and then descending. John chapter 1 verse 51, Jesus quotes that passage as a reference to what's going on in the kingdom. Listen, if the angels ascend from the earth and descend to the earth, where would the command center then be? Yeah. Yeah. Be the earth. He's going to tell Jacob that. I'm, he sees the ladder. He sees the angels going out, coming back to report. Go out and do your job. Come back to report. Verse 14, he confirms the Abrahamic covenant to Jacob. Thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So God is confirming the Abrahamic covenant now to Jacob. He did it to Isaac chapter 22, now he's going to do it to Jacob. Verse 16, Jacob awoke out of the sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and he said, how dreadful is this place? Notice, the location that he's in is important. This is none other than the house of God. That's where you get the name Bethel, house of God. And the, this is the gate of heaven. Now, when, when you read about a gate in the Bible, Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Government. What's that talking about? Government. That's where the government was carried on, in the gate. And when somebody in the Bible sits in the gate, they're talking about the government of, 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 the, of the city. 
Here's the gate of heaven. Listen, the government of the universe is, is designed by God. The reason he made this little peanut of a planet isn't so that it would sit across in a third class universe back out here the back side of nowhere. He made this planet to be the command center of the whole universe. And the angels go out, do its business, and come back. Now there's been a rebellion. Satan usurped that authority. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the whole purpose of, of the prophetic program is to bring back and to reestablish the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ over this planet through the instrumentality of a kingdom vested in that chosen group of people. Come with me to Exodus chapter 19, when he brings Israel out of Egypt. Exodus 19, verse 3. And Abraham went up unto God, and the Lord called him to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. I literally separated you out, Egypt a type of the world, I separated you out unto myself. When, when you talk about Israel being a holy nation, that word holy means to be set apart to be separated. God took them out of the nations and set them over here and said, you're mine. He did that at the Exodus. When he brought them across that Red Sea, that was the birthday of the nation Israel. As a nation. Verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then... You should be a peculiar treasure unto me, watch, above all people, for all the earth is mine. That's the reason when I draw that chart, I put the circumcision above the Gentiles. Because God, they're not, they're not taller than them. Sean's taller than any Jew I ever met. <laughs> Probably most, most Gentiles I've ever met, too. <laughs> He's not talking about physical stature. He's talking about spiritual... You're going to be the head of the nation and not the tail. I will make you above all people. You should be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You're going to be a set-apart nation and you're going to be a kingdom of priests. So they've got to, they understand that the purpose is for them to be a royal priesthood. Kings and priests under God. What does a king do? He, he, he controls the government. What does a priest do? He teaches the word of God. Malachi 2, 7, the function of a priest was to take God's word and teach it to the nation of Israel so they would know what to do. Israel is going to be a kingdom of priests. And in that, in that kingdom out there, Isaiah says that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the water covers the sea. And the glory of God will cover it. And you say, wow, how's that going to happen? It's going to go out, Isaiah 2 says, from Jerusalem. So when the Lord Jesus Christ comes over here, John the Baptist comes and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. They knew what he's talking about. They had the prophet. We'll go over that in detail tomorrow. Some brothers will. They had the prophecies back here that tell them about that kingdom. They know it's going to be a literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom that's going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. It's going to be set up on the throne of David, so the David covenant. And when John the Baptist comes and preaches, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the gospel of the kingdom is that that kingdom program out there is at hand. When, he, when they go out confessing their sins and are baptized of him, what do you do to ordain a priest into the ministry? Exodus chapter 29, the first thing you do is you wash him with water. Duh. So John, I baptize you with water. Then you anoint him with oil. John says, there's one coming after me who's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's what they're doing. That's what the baptism of John's about. That's what Pentecost is about. There's the, the baptizing with the Holy Ghost. What about people that won't pay any attention? They're set up baptized with fire. There's the baptism of fire that gets rid of the unbelievers. That program is working its way out. That's why when he chooses out the, the 12 apostles and 
forms that little flock. He says that little flock, fear not little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He trains them about going through that tribulation, about the Antichrist, the seventh week of Daniel. They've got all that information, the details of it, and how to matriculate through into that kingdom. Their hope back there was that thing out there. You start the book of Acts, and it's the same way. That's their hope. You start the book of Acts. Hebrews, um, just do one verse on that. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. By the way, if the book of Hebrews is written to who? How do you know that? You can read. Oh, okay, you can read. Good. I'll catch it on. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And not a one of you hadn't heard some preacher preach on that text. But a text without a context is a pretext, and most of the preaching you've heard of that verse has been, a, has been a pretext because they didn't pay attention to the context. Mm -hmm. I used to preach on the street for years and years, and many times I preached on the street and quoted that verse by way of application. But that's not the, that, that, you know, that's taking a verse and using an application. And, you know, God's going to preach, preach and anything you can do to get the gospel across, that's great. But look at what the verse is talking about. What salvation is he talking about? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. So the, the, the salvation that Hebrews is talking about began to be spoken by the Lord, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What salvation is that? Gospel of the kingdom. That there's a kingdom that you need to be ready for. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. That's the book, that's the first part of the book of Acts. God bearing them witness with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Ghost. That's the Pentecostal era. According to that verse, what, took, what takes place in the first seven chapters of the book of Acts is the continuation of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not something new. See, anybody tells you that the body of Christ began in Acts chapter 2 is telling you that God the Holy Ghost didn't know what he's talking about when he wrote Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 5. For under the angels hath he not put in subjection the world, what? Where would you put this? The world to come. Would that maybe fit right there? When John the Baptist talked about the Pharisees fleeing from the wrath to come, would that maybe fit like that? Verse 5 says, the world to come, notice, whereof we speak. What does the writer of the book of Hebrews think he's talking about? Time passed, but now the age is to come. Is to come. <clears throat> so if you were going to put Hebrews on that the timeline here, where would you put it? In the but now or the age is to come? Age is to come. Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is the age is to come. How do you know? You can read verse 5. <laughs> Hebrews to Revelation, fit right over there. Romans through Philemon where we are in here. You see, the index of your Bible, now right to divide the word is not, not the, well, the place of the books, it's just a fascination that your Bible, the index of your Bible is laid out exactly the way the program works out. So I know when I'm reading the Romans to Philemon, I'm reading but now. When I'm reading Hebrews to Revelation, I'm reading about the ages to come. When I read Matthew to first part of Acts, I'm reading time past. By the way, there are 13 books that begin with the name Paul. Mm -hmm. You'll know your apostle, and I speak to you Gentiles, but I'm the apostle Gentiles. He wrote, if you don't know where Paul's supposed to start, 13 books, Paul, 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 Paul. Mm -hmm. There are nine books over here, Hebrews to Revelation. There are four books back here Four and nine is what? 13. So there are 13 books written to the little flock. How many books in the New Testament? 27. 27. 13 and 13 is what? 26. So there's one book, there's one left. There's 13 books written to the little flock. The 13 books of the body of Christ. And then there's one book, the book of Acts, that's the transition from one to the other. 
Your Bible is the most amazing thing that you'll ever see. Listen, don't swap studying your Bible for studying commentaries. Mm -hmm. Or preachers. Or systems of <clears throat> denominational doctrine. Or systems of dispensational doctrine. Just take your take a King James Bible and just study it. Read it. What a concept. Now go back on to one, one thing and, and we'll pretty much be through. Isaiah chapter number 14. In one minute. Isaiah 14. <laughs> The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created. You know, Paul said, I'd rather speak five words than 10,000. You remember that verse? Mm -hmm. In the beginning God created. There's five words that can solve all the controversy, mm -hmm. all the confusion. You get those five words straight, and you can get the rest of it straight. What did he create? He didn't say he created everything. He said he created heaven and earth. You got Isaiah 14? I want you to compare it with Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 verse 16. For by him, and that's Jesus Christ, were all things created. So this is a verse talking about Genesis 1 1. That are in heaven and that are in earth. Okay. Visible, you can see them. Invisible, you can't see them. Now what are we talking about? Whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things, all thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers were created by him and for him. So in Genesis 1, when God created the heaven and the earth, he didn't just create stars and plants and planets. He created a governmental system to operate that creation. He created thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Positions of rank and authority in government. He created them in the earth. He created them in the heaven. How do I know? I read the verse. The ones on the earth I can see and understand because I can see them and understand. The ones in the heaven I can't see, but I can understand them because he uses the same term to describe the one here and the one out there. So I can understand the government in the heaven operates on the same principles that the government on the earth does because he uses the same word to describe both of them. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The next verse says, And the earth. And from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, all the way to the time you come to the Apostle Paul, the focus is on the earth. He made Adam out of the dirt of the earth. You are of the earth, earthy. He made a mud man and said, I'm going to put you and give you authority in the earth, and I want you to go out there and subdue the earth. Well then, wait a minute. When you subdue something, what does that tell you? It's in rebellion. So what happened to God's happy creation? Because the verse says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, and it was void, it was empty, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. Look. God is light in him. There's no darkness at all. Well, if he created something, he wouldn't have created it in darkness. If he's light, and in him is no darkness, 
Who is the prince of the power of darkness? Colossians 1 verse 13, he says he has, he has delivered us from the power, the authority of darkness. Who runs the kingdom of darkness? Who is it that has the, the principles of the darkness of this world? Ephesians 6. Satan. So there's something happened. Let me show you what happened. Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 12. Now this passage is a prophecy that takes place right there at the second coming of Christ, right before Satan is cast into the bottomless pit. It's not on that chart, but that's where, that's where this passage, Isaiah says it back here about what's going to happen to Satan right over here. But what it does, Israel is going to mock Satan as he's cast into the bottomless pit, but they're going to mock him and say, this is what you planned back here, and look what, what it got you. You ever done that? When, when, once you won, you mock people for what they, you said you were going to do, but look what's happened to you. Here's, here's the proverb that they cast at, at Satan. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That was Satan's original title. Lucifer, Luke's Pharaoh, light bearer. <laughs> Book of Job talks about his, his strong right arm. His job originally was to, was, was to be the one who led creation in the worship and service of the Creator. Who were they created for? Colossians 1, verse 7, verse 16. All the things that have been created by Him and for Him. The Lord Jesus Christ is the bright and morning star. Satan was created as the son of the mother. God always designed that desired to have sons. A son is a full-grown participant in the family. Watch what he does. How art thou fall? Ooh, that's not good. How art thou cut down to the ground? Which did weaken the nations. That's what he does in his career. For thou hast said, notice how it's all past tense. In thine heart. Now here's his original intent. I will ascend into heaven. Well, who sits on the throne in heaven? I'm going to go right up there and sit on the throne. I will exalt my throne. Notice Satan had a throne. He had a position of, of authority. Above the stars of God. Those are angels. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. I'm going to take over that throne too. I will sit above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now that's, that's what's important right there, right now. In your Bible, Genesis chapter 14, when Abraham went out, slaughtered, came back from the slaughter of those Gentile kings, and he met Melchizedek. Do you remember that? It says about Melchizedek that he was priest of the Most High God. That's the first time that, 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 that phrase occurs in the Bible. Look back there with me in Genesis 14. Is that me just telling you? Genesis 14, verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God. Here's an appositive. Here's a description of what God is as the Most High God. Possessor of what? <laughs> Heaven and earth. The term most high God is describing God as the one who is the possessor of all authority in the government of the heaven and the government of the earth. And what Satan did, what Lucifer did to become Satan, is he fomented a rebellion. That plan, that thing in Isaiah 14 is the plan that Ezekiel 28 says he went and merchandised among the princes of the, of, of the angelic creation. And won an angelic rebellion. God stopped that rebellion. Matthew 25 verse 41 says, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepare for who? The devil and his angels. God stopped that rebellion. 
There was a whole cadre of the angels, the elect angels that made a choice not to go with Satan, but to stay with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he stopped that rebellion with a judgment that was so devastating that it stopped it in his tracks. Then God did something that demonstrated his wisdom. He instituted a reconciliation plan. Go back with me to Colossians chapter 1. Verse 18. By the way, he instituted a reconciliation plan back here. He starts by reconciling the earth. He reveals the, the Abrahamic cut, the, the, the plan to re restore his authority to the earth through the nation Israel. When they come, when Jesus comes in that kingdom, those goat nations, those sheep nations, go into the kingdom, and he says, "Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world." From the time he put Adam on this earth, the issue in God's mind has been that kingdom. Mm -hmm. That's why he made Adam a king in the earth. Now, that's what everybody knew about. And if you restored his authority in the earth, there'd still be a whole universe that wasn't restored. So Colossians 1 verse 18, he made him to be head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the first one from the dead. Why did he make him the head of the body of Christ? that in all things, all those positions of dominions, principalities, powers, thrones, he might have preeminence. Now you have an agency of people, the body of Christ, this group up here, who can give Christ preeminence in the heavenly places. So now he won't have preeminence just in the earth. Now he'll have preeminence in all the positions in the heaven and in the earth. In the earth through Israel, in the heavens to the body of Christ. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. All what things? By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. The things in verse 16. People use that verse and say, well, see, even the devil's going to get, the verse not talking about getting saved. Reconciliation is not getting saved. Reconciliation is having your status changed. He takes the headship of these positions in the heavens and in the earth, and he makes peace, reconciles them through the blood of his cross. That is the goal of the mystery program. The goal of prophecy that's going to be accomplished here is to bring that rebellion to an end, throw it off the earth, and establish that kingdom. That will go on, by the way, forever, not just a short period of time. So when we're going to study these last days over here, what you're going to be studying is bringing that prophetic program to its conclusion. You're going to, you're going to see God bring all of the plan of the adversary to its conclusion, allow it to, the verse we read long about the sins of the Amorite aren't full, full, he's going to allow it to come to a fullness, work itself out, Demonstrate that this is what that plan will arrive at. Jesus told him in Matthew 24, he said, except those days be shortened, there be no length to get saved. So he shortens them to seven years. Actually, it took three and a half years. And then he brings it to a conclusion with the day of his wrath right here. And you go into that kingdom. Now, the gospel of the kingdom is, is this issue of restoring the earth back under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, when Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom back over here, Luke chapter 18 says they didn't know that he was going to die. Can you preach the gospel of grace today without, without preaching the blood of Christ? No. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins, buried, rose again the third day for our justification. The gospel today is the cross work. And yet for three years at least, the apostles went about, Jesus went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom 
And Luke chapter 8 19 says, chapter 18 says verse clearly that when Jesus began to show them that he's going to go to Jerusalem and die, well, if, that, if he began to show them in Matthew 16 and Luke 18, that means prior to that he didn't. And then when he did begin to show them he's going to go to Jerusalem and die and be resurrected, they didn't understand what he's talking about. In fact, in Matthew 16, Pete says, Man, what happened, Lord? I'm going to lay a hand on you. I mean, Here's a guy who's been preaching the gospel of the kingdom and doesn't even know about the cross. Don't let somebody tell you there's only one gospel in the Bible. When somebody says that, what they mean is there's only one gospel today. Now, they're dead right about that. But in the Bible, there's a lot more than one gospel. And the gospel of the kingdom is that gospel that has to do with what's going to happen in these last days over here. Now, the goal of prophecy is laid out for you in Daniel as the establishing of that kingdom, that headship of Christ over planet Earth. The goal of the mystery is to establish his headship in the government of the heavens. All of that's going to be done so that Ephesians chapter 1, well, so that the verse in Colossians that he might have preeminence in all things. And that's explained in detail in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse number 9 and 10. Having made known to God the mystery of his will, talking about God the Father, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. Notice, before the world began back here, I put it right there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had a council meeting. They had a board meeting. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, In hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. How do you promise something before the world began? Who would you promise it to? Would you ever make yourself a promise? But who's in the Godhead? The three people in the Godhead, aren't there? The Father, the Word, the Spirit. It's their names. First John chapter 5, verse 7 uses those name, proper names for them. Three people. He purposes in himself back here. You ever heard anybody talk about the eternal decrees? Mm -hmm. Mind of God and eternity? Hey. What they do in theology is to tell you you can't know it in the Bible, it tells you what it is. I love the Bible. <laughs> He purposed in himself what? That in the ages, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, way out over there, he might gather together in one all things in heaven and in earth. He's going to take all those positions of government in the heaven and in the earth and gather them together in one. Christ. He's going to make Jesus Christ the head over the whole thing and make one unit, one functioning unit out of the heaven and the earth by having the body in the heavens, the body of Christ in the heavens, Israel on the earth, all carrying out the same mind of Christ. And now you've got these two vastly different regions, realms, like you have these two vastly different groups of people back here, made one in Christ. You'll have these vastly different realms made one under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his ultimate purpose. When we study prophecy, we're going to be studying, we'll close that chart, we're going to be studying what the prophets back here point to in the ages to come. And when you're studying the last days, you're not studying us. I love the, uh, some of the brothers gave me some, a, uh, some CDs of Warren Lutzman. Some of you folks know him. And somebody asked him about some of this stuff out here. And he says, you know, I don't really worry about it because I ain't going to be there. Hmm. And I think that's probably the best answer. Now, I'm nosy. I'm nosier than he is. 
I want to know about it. I'm interested in it. It's in the book. I want to know. For two reasons. One, I'm nosy. Two, I don't want to have anybody bring that stuff into the dispensation of grace and put it on me. I want to understand what it is and where it fits. Mm -hmm. We study all the Bible, every bit of it, in the light of right division. Mm -hmm. You study all of it in the light of how Paul teaches us to study it. Because you consider what Paul says, and the Lord give you understanding in all mm -hmm. of his word. The first key to understand in the Bible is to have God, the Holy Spirit, be the teacher. So how do you know if you have God, the Holy Spirit, as your teacher? Well, there's two ways you know that. Number one, he teaches you through his word. He wrote a book. 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 9. He makes it very clear how he communicates. 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 9, he says, As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. On your own, with your eye gate, your, your ear gate, and your heart gate, you'll never know what God has for you. But God hath revealed them to us by his Spirit. Just because you can't get it doesn't mean you can't get it. You can't get it on your own. But God has revealed it to you by his Spirit. How did he do that? Verse 13, which things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Where do you find the words the Holy Ghost teaches? In the book. He wrote it in a book. He preserved that book through history. He's had it translated into your language, and you've got it sitting on your table there. In a King James Bible, you've got every verse that ought to be in the Bible is in your Bible. Every verse that ought not be in your Bible is left out of it. New versions leave a lot of verses out. They add verses in that shouldn't be there. You've got every verse that ought to be in the Bible, in your Bible, in the King James Bible, and you've got them translated into your language properly. So that you have in your hand the very Word of God in your language. And in your Bible, the Bible translated into your language is just as authoritative in the scripture as the original language that it came from. Doesn't lose any of its power. So what you have is the word of God, the word of his spirit. He teaches you through his word. But then you have to have his spirit. You have his spirit within you. How do you know you have that? Ephesians 1.13, he says, I'll read it to you because this stage of life I might not quote it right. In whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You hear that Jesus Christ died for your sins. The gospel of your salvation, folks, is not the gospel of the kingdom. They didn't even know Christ was going to die preaching that. You, you believe the gospel of the kingdom. Listen, Sunday morning, in churches all over this territory, there are going to be, going to be guys walking down an aisle and standing in front of a congregation and pray, Lord, we're going to give this offering for the ongoing of thy kingdom, and that's a lie right out of the mouth of the adversary. Mm -hmm. They'll say, we're going to receive these tithes and offerings. You are a despicable, reprehensible, whatever, <laughs> to teach people to tithe. Mm -hmm. You're a thief and a robber. You're an extortionist. And it's, you know, the kids watch that show, Despicable Me. You are a despicable you. Hmm. When you teach tithe. You say, well, but my church, listen, I don't care what your church does. I care what God's word says. Hmm. And they'll stand there for the ongoing of my kingdom. That's just a bunch of that's just a bunch of talk. God knows no wonder the ungodliness takes over. Because that profane and vain babbling's increasing to more ungodliness. 
Got no power to restrain the sin. The gospel is that Christ died for your sins, his spirit rose again, and that it's the power of God to everyone that believes. Mm -hmm. And when you believe that, then you are sealed that Holy Spirit of promise. How do you get the Holy Spirit? You believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died for your sins. If you have believed that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again, you've trusted him to be the Savior, he died, and rose again for you to be, you have the Holy Spirit. You say, I don't feel like it. It's not a feeling. Are you so foolish? Have you begun in the Spirit? You think it can be perfect through the flesh? December 31st, 1962, I trust, 1963, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I didn't feel it, but he did a bunch of wonderful things for me. I didn't know about it until I got to read my Bible. That's how you find out about it. It works in your spirit, not in your flesh. Your flesh is in your feet, where your feelings are. But if you've trusted Christ, you have God the Holy Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit who resides in you wants to teach you through that book, and he's given you the key to how to do it right there. Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness and grace to us. We pray that our faith might rest in you and your word. In Christ's name, amen. If you don't have to rush off, hang around. we got coffee, snacks. The more I said here tonight, great information. And, uh...